Welcome back, listeners, and thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are just tuning in, this is Heterodox Academy's new podcast, Heterodox Out Loud, where we bring you the best of our blog in audio format. I'm Amna Khalid, and I'm your guide for this series. In this episode, we focus on the political dimensions of censorship on campus. A lot of media coverage recently has focused on the cancelling and deplatforming of conservative speech on campus. Yet, liberal and progressive professors too have been the subject of similar harassment. Today, two articles. One is by Madeleine Kearns and the other from Ian Story. Both explore specific incidents that illustrate how, in academia, ideological intolerance is actually not monopolized by any movement and party. What Kearns calls a campus culture and Story describes as a toxic ecosystem of intolerance, this trend has led to self-censorship among students and professors and firings of individuals across the political spectrum. Ian Story's article, Political firings of left-leaning faculty, academic freedom is not a partisan issue, is narrated for you by Richard Davies. Campus speech has become a cause célèbre on the right, with pundits hammering away on the alleged excesses and intolerance of those they disparage as social justice warriors. As a result, Many popular liberal commentators have fallen into reflexively contradicting them, dismissing those Marie Uihara calls the free speech grifters and sifting through the data for evidence that all is well on the campus quad. This instinctive partisanship threatens to obscure the fact that the left has good reason to be just as concerned, if not more, with the state of freedom of expression, inquiry, and conscience in the academy. While much of the recent commentary in the ongoing debates over speech on campus has focused on apparent censorship of conservative speakers, a parallel toxic ecosystem has developed in which liberal professors can be subject to a combination of harassment and even death threats from the far right, powerful administrative pressures against controversial public speech, and political and legal action by outside conservative organizations. The canary in the coal mine was the firing last year of liberal adjunct professor and media commentator Lisa Durden from Essex County College after her appearance on Fox News defending Black Lives Matter. In a truly Kafkaesque statement, The college's president, Anthony Monroe, managed to simultaneously trumpet that Essex County College deeply values free speech and academic freedom and the open exchange of ideas and perspectives, yet still terminate Durden's employment for her statements. As grounds for Durden's firing, the college's administration claimed that they had been inundated with calls and emails from concerned parents and students. That would itself be questionable grounds for firing a professor over their political speech. But when FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, sued Essex County for the records of this alleged wave of concern, they found that the claim was entirely manufactured. No such pressure campaign existed. Durden's firing is far from an isolated case. In their reporting on her firing, NorthJersey.com found that Durden is only the most visible of no less than five recent cases in New Jersey alone. Inside Higher Ed notes a striking national rise in violent threats against professors for their public speech, particularly liberal ones, as well as a notable pattern of problematic responses from university administrations. The anecdotal evidence of the increased political scrutiny and pressure progressive professors face has been building for years as more professors have been speaking out about their experiences. However, a new data set 
provides insight into the scope of this problem, a liberal firings boon. Over the last several weeks, there has been a renewed debate about the reality and extent of the free speech crisis on campus. One faction, led by NYU psychologist John Haidt, insists that freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, and free inquiry are being threatened and undermined by increased levels of political polarization and intolerance. Another faction, led by Acadia political scientist Jeff Sachs, argues that the campus speech crisis is a myth and largely imaginary. However, Sachs's argument is refuted by his original empirical contribution to the debate, a data set on faculty firings. Over the last two years, the number of dismissals on speech grounds has more than quadrupled. There is a stark divide along partisan lines. While the terminations of conservative professors have doubled, the number of firings of liberals has boomed by no less than 950 percent. Of the 45 cases of faculty firings determined to be unambiguously related to speech, 26 of them occur in 2017 alone, compared to 6 in 2015, with the clear majority being over liberal speech. Even after adjusting the data by imposing a more strict, legalistic definition of political speech, the pattern remains extraordinary. Indeed, Sachs's data represents the extreme tip of a speech iceberg that includes protests, online harassment, intervention by outside political groups, and intense professional pressures. For example, Professor Rabab Abdul Hadi of San Francisco State has the support of her school's administration, but has been subjected to poster campaigns labeling her a terrorist supporter multiple lawsuits, and having her personal information circulated online to harassers. Faculty dismissals are only one small but important indicator of this more general shift in the political speech climate. Chris Quintina of the Chronicle for Higher Education has been quicker than others to pick up on the implication of these trends. There is an academic freedom crisis, he wrote, just one particularly acute on the opposite side of the political spectrum than most seem to expect. Yet it would be an error for progressives to use Sachs's data as justification for ignoring excesses of those on the left because the real problem is on the right, and ignoring or maximizing the concerns of conservative, religious, or other scholars who feel their freedom of expression, conscience, or inquiry is being threatened or undermined. The academic freedom crisis is multifaceted, covering multiple dimensions of the intensely complicated social fabric of the modern campus. Haidt has focused particularly on students. Others have persuasively argued that administrations are a more potent variable. Still others have emphasized the role professors have played in the changing campus climate or the pernicious influence of outside groups. If approached in a partisan way, it's easy to cherry-pick individual dimensions of the crisis to support a grievance politics that one's own side is being systematically wronged or wronged more. The right will point to patterns of disinvitation and a perceived hostile climate for conservative students and faculty driven by left-leaning activists. The left will point to patterns of faculty dismissal, as well as the professional and media harassment of professors, especially by the far right. The result is a systematic partisan missing of the forest for the trees. In the intellectual sphere, as it turns out, Ideological intolerance is not the monopoly of any particular party. Rather, what we are seeing is a wider systemic problem. Oliver Trolde locates it in belief intensity, or zealousness, in which the long-documented polarization of the political climate is bleeding into a polarization of the academic sphere. That polarization is being expressed at different levels of the university against different groups in different ways. For a principled commitment to speech rights and intellectual pluralism, all of those levels need to be treated with care, judicious examination of data, and appropriate concern. And concern is appropriate. 
regardless of one's political or ideological commitments. That was Ian's piece, Political Firings of Left-Leaning Faculty. And now, take a listen to Madeleine Kern's article, The Problems of Campus Culture, Presumption and Self-Censorship. This is narrated for you by Ashley Milne Tite. In August 2017, as an intern at The Spectator in London, I wrote a cover feature on campus tyranny alongside spiked editor Brendan O'Neill entitled Safe Spaces and Z-Badges, My Bewildering Year at a U.S. University. Although I relayed my experience cheerfully, my argument was a serious one. The university is riddled with paradox, safe spaces which are dangerously insular, the idea of no absolutes as an absolute, aggressive intolerance for anything perceived as intolerant, and censorship of ideas deemed too offensive for expression. It's a form of totalitarianism and it's beginning to infect British universities too. Evidently, the message resonated widely. The article was The Spectator's fourth most read piece of the year, and I received countless messages of solidarity from students and professors on both sides of the Atlantic. Yet during this time, I couldn't help but wonder why, given how many people seem to agree, the academic community remains quiet on these issues. The answer I have arrived at, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that the problem is less to do with campus politics, that is, bureaucracy, and more to do with campus culture, that is, prevailing attitudes. Consider, by way of example, this letter to the editor of The Spectator from an American PhD student. The student had done the reverse of me. She moved from New York to the UK for her doctorate studies because, she said, of the problems I had described. She wrote... The idea of a balanced argument at my undergraduate university in the U.S. was neoliberal versus radically liberal. We spoke of the importance of diversity, but political diversity was never considered. I thirsted for a deeper understanding of why half of Americans could hold opinions that were only met with dismissive ridicule or barely acknowledged. What I wanted was a wide exposure to different ideas and arguments, whether or not I agreed with them. She then referred to polarization in the U.S. more generally. In the U.S., if someone disagrees with you politically, they disengage from you and refuse to get to know you on a personal level. So I have often kept quiet among my peers, only revealing my true thoughts to those who have come out to me in the same way that Madeline describes. This has been compounded by the fact that my undergraduate degree was in gender studies, a famously radically liberal discipline, I am proud that I do not conform to the stereotype of a gender studies student. She concluded, I wish to remain anonymous, not because I am ashamed of my views, but because I want to be an academic and fear assumptions might be made about my politics. Academia is so liberal that though I am politically neutral or centrist, others might regard me as being conservative and not want to hire me. Nevertheless, I look forward to working towards a future where academics have intellectual freedom in the form of open discussion, not anonymous letters. Hence, while some have spoken up against political bias and while plenty have denounced censorship, there are more insidious forces sweeping British and American campuses, namely presumption and self-censorship. Before discussing these and their continual interference with the free exchange of ideas, it is necessary to comment briefly on the available evidence. In other words, to what extent do students and professors feel limited in their ability to express ideas? And how can we measure this? In December of last year, Heterodox Academy published a summary of its campus expression survey, which consulted 1,227 currently enrolled students in the USA. A similar study was conducted by FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Both surveys clearly show that a majority of students practice self-censorship. Of course, a more comprehensive data set could illuminate this in greater depth, But since these are matters of psychology and day-to-day behaviour, rather than specific policies or events, they are inherently less visible and, ergo, more likely to go unnoticed. 
on political presumption. The idea of a balanced argument was neoliberal versus radically liberal. While universities might not ostensibly prevent one from speaking one's mind, the parameters of acceptable dissent are implicitly narrow. Indeed, in On Liberty, John Stuart Mill is careful to distinguish between coercion by legislation and by popular opinion. But he argues that both are deadly to free thought. On moral positions, for instance, university stances on social justice issues leave little room for challenge. For example, if you're not for reproductive rights, you must be against women. Of course, this is to radically simplify the field of bioethics and to ignore the fact that many women are themselves anti-abortion. In The Closing of the American Mind, Alan Bloom wrote that The liberally educated person is one who is able to resist the easy and preferred answers, not because he is obstinate, but because he knows others are worthy of consideration. However, he also warned about the dangers of cultural relativism, the belief that there is no such thing as objective truth. Indeed, conviction that the application of reason can lead to the discovery of truth is woven into the very foundations of U.S. institutions of higher learning – and even American democracy itself. For this reason, as he worked to establish the University of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson charged, This institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind, for here we are not afraid to follow truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. In the contemporary context, however, reason itself has been destabilised and replaced by seemingly aimless discourse. What, then, are we left with, save, I feel, therefore it is? It is with great difficulty that a mindset such as this can coexist with facts. On the one hand, we can all agree that there must be standards of accuracy – It is egregious when, for example, the President of the United States lies to the American people. But on the other hand, certain facts, those which are deemed politically inconvenient, are frequently ignored or derided. This is the point that Professor and Heterodox Academy member Steven Pinker made at a spiked event at Harvard in 2017. Pinker, who was himself on the political left, gave examples of facts that are absent from university discussion on account of being considered too controversial. The examples he gave were, capitalist societies are better than communist ones, men and women are not identical in their life priorities, sexualities, tastes and interests, and different ethnic groups commit violent crimes at different rates. Naturally, Pinker went to considerable effort to clarify that he was not inferring racist or sexist conclusions from these observations. Quite the reverse. His suggestion was that the university's failure to address these facts and to provide reasonable conclusions had fueled distrust for mainstream liberalism and driven some into the arms of the alt-right. Unfortunately, because meaningful challenge is so rare on campus, students have little but outrage with which to defend their opinions. Moreover, in relying on a caricature of their opponents, they have, as Mill argued, been intellectually shortchanged. In his chapter on the liberty of thought and discussion, he wrote why it's a mistake to shut out opposing views. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth – If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth, produced by its collision with error. Mill's argument, incidentally, presupposes the belief in truth, thus upholding the principles of the Enlightenment. On self-censorship Imagine that you are an 18-year-old student. Perhaps you were raised in a liberal household or perhaps in a conservative one – Let's say, for argument's sake, that you have arrived at a top American university. Like the other freshmen in your class, you're intelligent, insecure, and largely ignorant. As classes begin, you start to absorb the signals, the mantras, the sound bites, and principles of relativism and progressivism. In categorical and absolute terms, you learn of the stupidity and malice of the other side. 
In this climate, would you, young and looking to make friends as you are, dare to voice a different view? Would you, on your own time, question such assumptions? Maybe you would. But the likelihood is that you would not, or at least you would rather not, because it would make your student life difficult. These are not hypotheticals, but real people. An Oxford undergraduate who identifies as liberal and a feminist tells me she is a secret heretic, fearful to voice her doubts on gender fluidity and intersectionality, while a liberal professor at New York University tells me she's exhausted trying to qualify every lesson with progressive frames. And if this is how many liberals feel, can you imagine what it's like to be a conservative? Madeline Kern's blog, Presumption and Self-Censorship. Before I go, I want to remind you to sign up for our upcoming live webinar on March 9th titled A Fine Balance, Academic Freedom and Academic Responsibility. We'll be joined by Judith Shapiro and Brian Rosenberg as they plumb the depths of the various aspects of academic freedom and the limits of viewpoint diversity on campus. Learn more and register on our website, heterodoxacademy.org. As always, I would like to thank Fatima Zwed and Zach Rausch and our communications team, and Richard Davies and Miranda Schaefer at Davies Content who produce our podcasts. I'm Amna Khalid. Until next time, thanks for listening to Heterodox Out Loud.